privilege it is to be back in your holy sanctuary again this morning. And we give thanks for all of the blessings you've bestowed upon each and every one of us this past week, both as individuals and a community. And we seek your blessing again this day, that you should draw us a little closer into your heart, so that our hearts may be mended and filled with your spirit. In Christ's name we pray, amen. <clears throat> amen. Yeah, I have been binge watching Downton Abbey. Yeah. Now I started doing this in anticipation of the movie coming out, which I still haven't seen. So I took a little break, I think after the first three seasons, and now I'm watching the last three seasons. Now the interesting thing is I have done this before. I've seen them all and not even that long ago. I did not watch the series when it first came on television so many years ago, but now this is the second time I've watched all six seasons, 52 episodes in a short period of time, sometimes five or six episodes a day. Yeah, please do not do the math so you can figure out how long I am sitting in front of the television every day watching Downton Abbey. The simple fact of my telling you this is that they still hold my attention. I know all of the plot twists before they happen. Who's going to die? Who's going to get married? Who's dissing who every day in particular week? What great surprise is going to happen in the next hour? And of course, I have memorized my favorite Maggie Smith cutting one-liners as she plays the Dowager Countess. What is a weekend, she says. <laughs> and yet, I continue to watch. And I was watching it on Friday, and I began to wonder, why? You know, why do I and millions of other people on two different continents, well, actually around the entire world, why do we continue to watch? So much so that they had to go and make a whole new movie just to satisfy our appetite for the story to continue. Why, I was thinking. I've seen these before. Well, I think why. I just mentioned a few of them. There's wonderful plot twists. There's witty one-liners. And there's the ups and downs of all the people who live both up and downstairs. I mean, they're good stories in little packages, so they're entertaining. But as I was watching on Friday, on my couch with my blanket and my cat, it occurred to me that not only are they good stories, they're stories we can relate to on a personal level. For just as most of you, if not all, I think, you know, probably nothing of the physical appearance in my own life resembles anything like that of the British upper class of the early 1900s, or today for that matter. <coughs> my life is much more like those who live downstairs, working and living their lives in service, they even call it. And yet, <clears throat> the beauty of Downton Abbey is that once you have watched even just a couple of episodes, you find yourself relating to all of the characters. Because the creator of these characters made them all so very human. Each of them, no matter where they live or what they do, portray the same emotions. You know, a joy and fear and jealousy and happiness and grief. And each of them deals with their emotions in very familiar ways, like anger and denial, retreat, self-harm, harm of others. So whether it is the mostly deplorable characters of Thomas or Miss O'Brien, 
or the very lovable yet short-lived characters of Lady Sybil and Matthew Crawley. We can relate to each and every one of them because I think of the one thing they all have in common for us, with us. And that is, they are all just looking to belong. Either belong downstairs or belong to that crazy family upstairs. And because of all of that, and this yearning to simply fit in and belong, Downton Abbey has now taught a whole generation about humanity. You know, it first came on in 2012 in the United States and a couple years earlier in England. So that's, that's over 10, that's 10 years, almost. So for these 10 years, real-life human beings and, and situations have been portrayed in the fictional characters who live in Downton Abbey. And their hopes and dreams suddenly become our hopes and dreams. But I was, as I was watching on Friday, I, I thought to myself, you know, we do have to remember, however, that this is just a TV show. And as entertaining and thought-provoking as it might be, there is no real place called Downton Abbey, and the characters are not real. And so, after watching several hours on Friday, I had to crawl out from under my blanket and go out and try to find these things in the real world and try to live in the real world as some of my favorite characters do. Facing life and hardship with stoic resolve, caring for others while my burdens remain heavy, seeking a community to which I can finally belong. Don't we all do that on a daily basis? Well, the good news of today is that we have such a place, and it's not fictional. We are sitting in it. And I am so thankful this morning that you are here. For you see, I don't just watch Downton Abbey. I also watch the news. And, well, I, actually, I want to ask, is anyone else just exhausted from watching all the events going on in the world? I mean, it's exhausting just to watch a half hour. It's depleting, it's disheartening, it's soul-killing. It makes us want to hate some of our neighbors instead of love them. To curse entire populations of people instead of bless them. To run and hide from trouble and instead of standing for and caring for those in trouble. But what we need to remember, even in the face of all of that, that, that we are not characters in a television show that can just turn the news off and not care anymore. We are children of God, called, ordained, and, and sent into this world to make a difference in real life, in the real lives of others. And I know that each of us knows the truth that this world that can bring so much joy can also inflict great pain. And it, 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 it is pain, oddly enough, that is usually the thing that brings people together. You know, we can be happy for someone else's happiness, but that doesn't necessarily mean we are moved to action to increase their happiness. We may be. But when we see each other in pain, we are much more easily moved to ease one another's pain. 
because we know what that feels like too. And we don't do that to gain anything for ourselves. We do it out of a genuine desire to help. With no need to be repaid or praised or recognized for our humble action, which would be the actual opposite of humility. And humility, by the way, they say, is the key to God's heart. So I saw one of those great memes the other day. You know, those things on the internet of quotes. I never knew what a meme was, but I'm going to start using that word. <laughs> so there was a meme of Jimmy Carter and a quote of his when he said once, I have one life and one chance to make it count for something. Now I am free to choose what that something is. And the something I have chosen is my faith. And he says, my faith goes well beyond simple religion and theology. For my faith requires considerable work and effort. My faith demands, and this is not optional, he says, my faith demands that I do whatever I can, wherever I am, for as long as I can, with whatever I have, to try to make a difference. And one of the key words in that quote is try. Simply try to make a difference. Informed and hope, hopefully altered by our faith, we go out of this place and try to make a difference. I often wonder what other people use to inform and perhaps alter their lives. For, you know, I know plenty of people who do not profess any sort of religious or spiritual faith whatsoever, and their lives seem to bounce around a lot. Kind of like little kids running from one thing to another imitating whomever is the animated star of the latest Disney film, who we then buy dolls and action figures of to, to teach them that that's what you should be like. Then when we grow up to be adults, is it little wonder that our attention and our lives are mostly informed by Facebook posts? the unending news cycles on CNN, Fox News, or the multitude of un online news resources. Please only watch Jeff for your news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if that was all there was to inform our lives, we would le live exhausted all the time, having to move so quickly from one current trend to another, one emotional tug on the internet to another, constantly altering my interior self in response to all the exterior things going on. Most of which I have come to learn I have no control over. I'm not saying we ignore the world we live in. Am I personally extremely upset at what I see going on in Syria, in Washington, D.C., in neighborhoods across Wilmington that suffer gun violence every day, every weekend, domestic violence, drug addiction every day? You know what goes on in most of those little motels that line Market Street? I'm very upset about those things. The question is, what can I do about it? What can we do about it? Can we do anything about it? 
I mean, ask yourself, how do I know what it is that I can do, where I am with what I have? How do we encounter all of these things every single day? First, without simply going crazy. And second, actually moving among all of these counters and counters, offering care and assistance and not craziness back at them. Well, I think we do this by placing above all else our encounter with Jesus. The one to whom we first cry out with our concerns and then move out into the world with our faith. For how many times did Jesus say, it is that your faith that has made you well. Did you ever notice that, by the way? It's not God's made you well now. He always said it is your faith that has made you well. So faith, which like Jimmy Carter said, it's, it's much more than a simple set of beliefs that you have to memorize. And what if I only remember eight today and you remember ten? You know, am I worse than you? I mean, faith is a condition by which we live our lives centered on not the shifting sands of this world, but the historic and proven truths of humble action that says to us, if you can serve, go serve. If you're good at encouraging others, go encourage someone. If you're a good leader, lead humbly. If you're good at mercy, be an example of mercy to others. And do not think too highly of yourselves or seek praise for your actions. For what good will it do anyone to reap all our rewards here on earth and forfeit our souls? We have them, by the way. We need to protect them. And you know what? We have, each week, we have one hour to come in here and refresh our spirits, renew our faith, and remember that we have a soul to protect to begin with. One hour to hopefully receive enough refreshment and renewal that we feel equipped once more to go back out into the world and show mercy and give encouragement to all, this, to all of those who are still struggling in their spirits, still face death and oppression every single day. And so our worship does not end with our closing hymn each week. Actually, listen to pay attention to the words of our closing hymn this, hymn this week, for they speak not only of refreshment of our own spirits, but then going out into the world and sharing our spirits with others. You know, we are, we are just now beginning this period at St. Jude's called New Possibilities. And I am going to mention this every single week from now on, somehow. Because it is vital that we all participate. Using whatever we have, however we can, to use whatever St. Jude's has to help not just St. Jude's, but Wilmington, Leland, North Carolina, the United States, a whole world to help an entire world know that love equals life and life equals love. For you see, what we do in this one hour is we give thanks to God for, all, for the blessings we have received of life and love and encouragement that we receive here and from one another. We come and give thanks. That's what this hour is for. One hour, totally devoted to God. 
So I'm going to add in here. I saw another great meme this week on the internet. It said, churchgoer says to other churchgoer, I didn't enjoy worship today. Churchgoer says to first churchgoer, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. <laughs> One hour to devote to God. There's been 167 other hours in a week for ourselves, for us to decide what to do with them. We can constantly scroll through Facebook, going blind and crazy, watch endless hours of our favorite TV shows, or pick up the phone and call someone a friend, a senator, or we can feed the hungry who gather here every single week, or perhaps just share a smile and a piece of good news with a complete stranger. Whatever it is you have, wherever you are at any given time, use that. And use it wisely. For the gifts we have to share are just that. They're gifts. They've been given to us. We should want other people to have them. We really do want other people to be happy. So let the encounter with Christ inform your life and alter the ways you respond in this world. For it is that encounter that brings peace, peace of heart, peace of mind, peace of body, and peace of soul among the turmoil we live in. Amen. 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 Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we do want to say thank you once more simply for the gift of life that you gave us again this morning. The ability to come to this place, to rise and sing and sit and share and smile with one another. And God, we ask that you continue to bless us and give us the strength and the courage and the wisdom to help all of those who could use our help. And God, we pray this day for all of those who do not know any of these things, do not know about your love or any love in their lives, who sit alone, who do not know healing, who suffer tremendous pain both in their bodies and their minds and their souls, Pour out your Spirit upon them that they may know a little bit about grace. We ask this as in all things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And now, my friends, let us take a moment of silence and allow that healing Holy Spirit of God to descend upon us again this day.